Well, turn with me in your Bibles to Psalm 131. Psalm 131. Now, this is a beautiful little psalm. Uh, It's been one which has very much been on my mind and heart for a few months now. And uh, it's really, it's been a psalm that I think has particularly struck a chord with my own heart. And that I do hope that by the work of the Spirit really uh, strikes a chord with your heart as well. So we're going to read this little psalm together. Psalm 131, a song of ascents of David. O Lord, my heart is not lifted up. My eyes are not raised too high. I do not occupy myself with things too great and too marvellous for me. But I have calmed and quieted my soul like a weaned child with its mother. Like a weaned child is my soul within me. O Israel, hope in the Lord from this time forth and forevermore. Now will you pray with me now? Well, Lord God Almighty, uh, you invite us to consider yourself as the one who is able to do immeasurably more than we could ever ask or imagine. And Lord, all throughout the scriptures, you constantly invite our great prayers. And so, Lord, we do pray that you would do more than we anticipate you would do this morning. Our Lord, we pray that by your word and by the power of your spirit, that you might uh, manifest yourself to us, Lord, uh, that we would know you and that our hearts would be persuaded that you are the God we can safely uh, wait quietly for. So please would you come, Lord. Father, you know our hearts. You know our desires, our fears, our circumstances. So please come and speak the words that you know we need to hear. Our Lord, so that we would find all of our hope and comfort in you. And so you would be glorified in our lives. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I wonder if your soul is calm and quiet before the Lord this morning. Maybe if you think of it as being like a vast ocean. And if your soul is like, or your heart is like a vast ocean, uh, is it an ocean that is uh, calm and peaceful? Uh, little ripples constantly going by uh, under a blue, s- blue sky are uh, peaceful and, and at rest. Or is your soul a lot more like a violent storm uh, where there's towering waves kind of rising up and then crashing down uh, where the wind howls and Uh, The rain pelts down. Uh, Everything is chaotic and agitated and never truly at rest. And if you're anything like myself, then I'm sure that you at least know, uh, if not constantly experience, what it is uh, for your heart to be often agitated, uh, often like the stormy seas, Uh, You're seldom at rest. You find yourself constantly uh, agitated, uh, anxious, concerned about uh, something or a rather. And there is a lot to be agitated about in our lives, isn't there? Uh, We live in a time where the basic structure and routines of our lives have been shifted, uh, altered by COVID and different government responses. Our house prices are going through the roof, so it's easy to feel agitated about our finances and money. And that's without even mentioning, actually, are the personal trials that we face in our own lives, our tensions, pressures, our struggles that we have in our jobs and our, our families and relationships and our mental state, perhaps. You see, there's a lot that can make us uh, deeply agitated, isn't there? 
And that really gets at the heart of this beautiful little psalm. This little psalm is God's invitation to rest and quiet, uh, to pursue a calm and a settled faith before God. And I suspect, brothers and sisters, that it is an invitation uh, that many of us need this morning. And so we're going to think about what it means and looks like to have a quiet soul before God. And the first part of that in verse 1 is the obstacle to a quiet soul. The obstacle to a quiet soul. So this psalm is written, uh, as we read, by David, uh, the man after God's own heart. And really it gives us a glimpse into David's inner life and inner consciousness. And verse is 1 to 2 form a prayer to God, uh, where he starts by explaining what his heart is not. And so as we start thinking about this little psalm together, I want you to think with me about a question. And the question is this. What is the greatest obstacle to peace and calm in your life? What is the greatest obstacle to peace and calm in your life? What's the biggest hindrance to it? And I wonder how you would answer. Uh, maybe it's these uncertain times we find ourselves in, or that you would feel far calmer if we uh, return to uh, a normal state of routines. Maybe it's other circumstances in your life, uh, things that you can't control, things that feel like they're out of your hands. And maybe it's your personality, your temperament, uh, that if only you weren't like an emotional yo-yo, up and down and up and down. Well, David here, uh, led by the Holy Spirit, gives us a different answer. If you read verse 1 with me, he says this, uh, O Lord, my heart is not lifted up, my eyes are not raised too high, I do not occupy myself with things too great and too marvellous for me. Or as it reads in the NIV, if you've got one in front of, it, in front of you, uh, my heart is not proud, my eyes are not haughty. And that phrase down in verse 1, that my heart is not lifted up, is a phrase that's used a number of times throughout the Old Testament and really is used to demonstrate a posture of pride. And one of the places where it's used is in Second Chronicles chapter 26. Now you feel free to turn there with me if you would like, but you don't have to. Uh, Second Chronicles 26. And if you look down at this chapter, uh, the chapter is all about King Uzziah, who was one of the good kings of Judah. And if you look down at verse 5 with me, it shows us that Uzziah was a godly man, that he set himself to seek God in the days of Zechariah. And as this good king sought after God, our God prospered him greatly. Uh, he crushed the Philistines, restored Jerusalem. Uh, he had a huge standing army. But if you look down at verse 16, uh, it goes on to say, but when he was strong, he grew proud to his destruction. And that's the exact same phrase as the one used in Psalm 131. And if you know the rest of the story, uh, in his pride, King Uzziah tried to enter into the temple and to, to offer a sacrifice which only priests were allowed to do. And God struck him with leprosy. Now, he was, to all appearances, a God-fearing man. Yet in his prosperity and times of strength, uh, he grew proud. He began to think of himself as above God's word. He began to attribute his own success not to God's grace and mercy, but instead to his own abilities. And really that's the picture here in verse 1 of Psalm 131, 
that what it's describing in verse 1 is a proud heart, a heart that's governed by self-will and self-sufficiency. It's the attitude of a man or a woman uh, who no longer think they need God, but instead practically live as if they had the sufficient resources uh, in themselves for everyday living. You see, pride is the disposition of the heart uh, that really acts as if I don't need God. It's in effect when we are trying to be God, when we decide for ourselves actually, I'm going to solve my own problems, order my own life, shape my own paths. And in a similar way, that expression also in verse 1 of your eyes being lifted up, is that same insidious idea of prideful self-sufficiency. In Proverbs 6, in verse 16, it says, There are six things that the Lord hates, seven that are an abomination to him. And do you know what's first on the list? Haughty eyes. It's a person who looks with disdain on others. The person who constantly finds themselves comparing them uh, with others and thinking, well, at least I'm not like them. Are the sort of person who finds themselves often looking down on other Christians or other people. And pride doesn't always look like someone who's strong and successful as King Uzziah was. But actually, you can be suffering and proud, just as you can be prosperous and proud. You see, at the heart of it, pride isn't simply arrogance, but instead it's a disposition of the heart that tries to be God, tries to control what only God can control, tries to know what only God can know. You see, to think that you're sufficient for your own life is not in a strength or character, but actually, according to this psalm, it's pride. And it's like a blockage in a pipe uh, which obstructs the grace and peace of God from flowing into our lives. You see, you will never find a calm and a quiet spirit before God while you are trying to do what only God can do. And one of the pictures that this psalm invites us to ponder is that of a child. You see, this prideful heart It's a little bit like a very young child uh, who thinks that they're grown up and thinks that they can do everything on their own. And so whether it's getting themselves breakfast or climbing over rocks or getting changed, uh, they're constantly saying, I don't need your help. I can do it on my own. Uh, But they can get very agitated and very annoyed because they can't. And actually, whether they like it or not, Uh, They need help. They're not sufficient in and of themselves. Are they trying to control things they can't control? Trying to do things they can't yet do? And the proud heart does exactly the same. It's constantly trying to do everything out of its own strength. It's constantly subconsciously saying to God, I don't need your help. I can do this on my own. But we can't. And so we grow agitated and anxious and angry. And so you might be thinking, well, James, how do I know if I've got a proud heart? How do I know if actually if I'm trusting in my own strength? And perhaps one of the most accurate indications of a proud heart is actually a lack of prayer. You see, if you don't pray then ultimately it shows that uh, you don't think you need God or that you think you only need him in exceptional circumstances. You see, pride says, I don't need God in anything, where faith says, I need God in everything. And so actually a lack of prayer in our lives can be uh, a clear indication and symptom uh, of a deep-rooted self-sufficiency. Uh, that we're trying to achieve out of our own strength what only God can do. So firstly, the obstacle to a quiet soul. 
And now secondly, are the experience of a quiet soul in verse 2. So having told us what he's not, uh, that his heart is not proud, his eyes are not haughty, he goes on to show us what his heart is like, uh, what a quiet soul before the Lord looks like. And so if you read verse 2 with me, uh, David goes on to say, but I have calmed and quieted my soul like a weaned child with its mother, like a weaned child is my soul within me. So instead of being rough and agitated and tumultuous, uh, his, his soul is calm. It's at rest. Actually, that, even that word calm there really described a piece of land that was rough and hilly, but had been smoothed and evened out so that a, a crop could be planted on it. Now the rough parts have been smoothed over, the ditches have been filled in. And he uses a particularly evocative picture to describe this for us. Uh, like a weaned child with its mother. And really the process of a weaning is to accustom and to train a child or, or a baby uh, to move from feeding on its mother's milk uh, to, to be feeding on other sources of food. And if you've ever seen a, a baby that's uh, thirsty for its mother's milk, uh, it's agitated and annoyed and impatient. And if the mother is nearby and he has not yet been fed, uh, the baby squirms this way and that. Uh, he uh, yells to be fed. If, if the baby could talk, he would be saying, I'm hungry. I need some to eat now. But a weaned child is a child that's learned to wait and to eat at regular times. That instead of feeding at random intervals from his mother's milk, uh, he now eats other sources of food at more regular times. There's not that same level of uh, agitation and impatience, but instead there's a sense of calmness there. And so David's saying in this verse, actually, I'm no longer like that unweaned child, but instead my soul has been weaned. I've learnt to wait silently. I'm not constantly agitated and, and impatient now, but I've trained my heart to be calm and still before my Lord. Natalie, maybe like myself, Maybe you find this picture somewhat convicting. Because we're often not like this, are we? Often as soon as something happens that we don't like, or as soon as some form of suffering enters into our lives, are we bellowing like an unweaned child? God, take this away. God, why? God, remove it right now. God, I need you to take it away at this very moment. You see, part of Christian maturity is knowing what it is to wait upon the Lord. And in some ways, it seems to be something that's uh, increasingly rare among modern Christians, uh, the forgotten grace of waiting quietly and suffering patiently. That's a spirit of calm and peace before God. In every way, it's the opposite of the agitation of our pride and self-will, but instead it's a calm and a settled faith before God, uh, that trust that God will do what he needs to do in his own time. And it's important for us to learn, brothers and sisters, that this is something that must be learned and grown in and developed uh, it's not a gift of nature, but instead it's a result of grace. And so in verse 2, he says, I've, I have calmed and quieted my soul. It's something that I've had to sort after, uh, grow and develop in. And it wasn't that David had a stress-free life, uh, anything but. Uh, if you know much of the story of David, you'll know that he had huge amounts of pressure on him. Uh, for much of his life, he was being hunted and pursued by his enemies. Uh, he had to flee his own country 
uh, almost as a refugee. Uh, when he came back as king, he had uh, weighty and heavy responsibilities on him. Uh, even his own sons tried to overthrow him. Uh, it must have put huge emotional and mental pressure on David. And so this calm and quiet soul, it doesn't come from an easy life. And it doesn't come from simply having the right personality. But instead it's a posture of heart uh, that he's had to learn. You might remember in Philippians chapter 4, uh, when Paul is writing to the Philippians church, and he says in verse 11 that I've learned in whatever situation to be content. I know how to be brought low and how to abound. In any and every circumstances, I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hungry and hunger. And in fact, even that picture of uh, the weaning of a child I should indicate to us that this isn't something easily attained or attained without struggle. Uh, weaning a child's hard. No child wants to be weaned. It means having to deal with hunger and waiting when you want to be fed now. Now, The old preacher, Charles Spurgeon, said of this little psalm uh, that this is one of the shortest psalms to read and one of the longest psalms to learn. And here in this little psalm, uh, we don't only get a window into David's inner life, but we also get a window into Jesus in a life. You see, when we read this psalm, uh, really we should read this as actually describing uh, the state of Jesus' heart uh, when he lived on earth. That above all, Jesus was the one whose heart was not lifted up, his eyes which were not raised too high. Now that he was the one who had calmed and quieted his soul before God, like a weaned child with its mother. You see, I wonder if you've ever thought about um, just how many reasons Jesus had to be uh, agitated and anxious and tumultuous in his life, uh, for his emotions to be like the storm-tossed sea. His own people rejected him. Uh, his blood family thought he was out of his mind. His disciples, who he came to train, were a bunch of slow-to-learn misfits. The religious leaders were persecuting him and attempting to kill him. And through all of his earthly ministry, he knew within himself of the agony and the anguish of the cross that was still to come. You see, Jesus had every reason to lie awake at night, unable to sleep, tossing and turning uh, with nausea, to be like the agitated, unweaned child. But instead he was calm and quiet before the Lord and so paves the way for us to do the same. Which leads us to the final point, which is the way to a quiet soul. So if this is something that we have to learn and seek, then how do we learn it? How do we seek it? What does that even look like? Well, having, as it were, bared his heart before God, David gives us in verse 3 the clear application. Verse 3, O Israel, hope in the Lord from this time forth and forevermore. You see that the application isn't unclear or complicated but it's actually very straightforward that he's calling the people of God in every age uh, to hope in the Lord, to wait in him and trust in him. That instead of taking matters into our own hands and working ourselves into agitation, we are to wait quietly for him, knowing that actually his hands are the ones on the steering wheel. You see, I can see a lot of agitated Christians in our day and age. In many ways, I see it in myself, that we want to wrestle some form of control in our lives, 
And so we're constantly agitated and frantic and are anxious. But actually, this psalm before us is a call, as it were, to take a deep breath and remind ourselves, actually, the world isn't in my hands, but it's in God's hands. And I don't know the future, but my God and Father does. And I don't see the whole plan, but I trust that my Father is working out his purposes and these present trials, they, they feel terrible. I wish I didn't have them in my life. But I trust even they are part of my good and wise Father's good purposes towards me. And maybe the greatest aid to this is actually learning, brothers and sisters, what it is every day of your life to fix your eyes upon the Lord Jesus Christ. You see, it's in Jesus that, as it were, we see the heart of God unveiled. You see, it's in Jesus that we see the full extent of God's love. It's in Jesus that we see our God's tender compassion towards sufferers. It's in Jesus that we see just how far the love of God will go. And so if you've got doubts in your heart about whether God is worthy of your trust, whether it's truly safe for you to wait quietly on him, then fix your eyes upon the Lord Jesus Christ. Consider him. Study him. Seek him. You see, it's in Jesus Christ above all that we see that God is infinitely worthy of our trust, that we are safe in him. And not only so, but Jesus is the one who has sent his Holy Spirit into our lives uh, to enable this very thing. You see, only grace can conquer and vanquish an agitated heart. And Christ has sent his Spirit for this very purpose. And so actually one vital way in which we grow in a, a quiet soul before the Lord is actually through our trials that affliction and suffering, whatever form they may happen to take in our lives, are actually the very normal means that God uses to wean us from pride and self-sufficiency. You see, suffering always has a purpose in God's kingdom. It's never uh, it's simply random. And at least one thing which God is doing through uh, your struggles and your suffering this morning is giving you an opportunity to grow in a quiet soul before him. You see, no Christian enjoys suffering, just as no child enjoys being weaned. But in both cases, uh, the reward is worth the cost. Uh, we want our comfortable present lives, but God has something so much better in store for us. And so maybe there are trials and pressures and tensions are within your heart this morning. Maybe you've been like uh, the unweaned child, uh, anxious, agitated, constantly squirming this way and that. And if so, then actually your trial is an opportunity to grow. It's a time where maybe you need to slow down and reflect. Actually, my Father's hand guides us, and so I will wait for him. Maybe even this morning, you need to pray the prayer. Our God, even through this trial, which I wish was never in my life, would you calm and still my heart before you? Would you use even this to wean me from pride, to wean me from self-sufficiency, and to foster a quiet soul within me. You see, the school of Christ is not simply an hour or two on a Sunday when we uh, listen to a sermon and sing some songs, but actually his classroom in which he teaches us and grows us is the normal ups and downs of our lives. And so, brothers and sisters in the Lord, hope in him, 
weight upon him. Repent of any sense of pride and self-sufficiency and seek a calm and a quiet spirit uh, which only God can give. Well, as we come to a close, I'm going to read for us uh, a beautiful old hymn which we're going to sing immediately after the sermon. And so maybe even to concentrate, you could uh, close your eyes and see these as uh, the words which are spoken to your heart. And it says this, it says, Be still, my soul, for God is on your side. Bear patiently your cross of grief or pain. Leave to your God to order and provide. In every change, he faithful will remain. Be still, my soul. Your best, your heavenly friend, through thorny ways leads to a joyful end. Be still, my soul, your God will undertake to guide the the future as surely as the past. Your hope, your confidence, let nothing shake. All now mysterious shall be clear at last. Be still, my soul. The waves and winds still know the voice, his voice who ruled them while he dwelt below. Be still, my soul, when dearest friends depart. And all is darkened in the veil of tears. Then you shall better know his love, his heart, who comes to soothe your sorrow, calm your fears. Be still, my soul, for Jesus can repay from his own fullness all that he takes away. Be still, my soul. The hour is hastening on when we shall be forever with the Lord. When disappointment, grief, and fear are gone, sorrow forgot, love, pu- love's purest joys restored. Be still, my soul. When change and tears are past, all safe and blessed, we shall meet at last. Will you pray with me? Lord God Almighty, our Father and our Shepherd. Uh, We ask that you would calm and quiet our souls within us. Uh, Like a weaned child with its mother, so may our souls be before you, Lord. And Father, you know us. You know, Lord, that we are often anxious and agitated. Lord, our emotions and mental state is often like the Uh, wind-tossed seas. And Father, we pray that you would foster a quiet and a childlike faith within us. We we pray that you would teach us, our Lord, to repent of self-sufficiency, to repent of trying to be strong enough, our Lord, so that we would find all of our strength and all of our rest in you. Lord, you are the one who invited us to seek rest from you. And so we trust that you alone can give it. Please would you come, Lord, and train us to be people who wait silently for you. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.